Hey, thank you for that kind introduction, Liam. It's true, I am very, very, very excited about WebAssembly, and I'm especially excited that there were so many new hands in the audience. So uh, I think this is a good talk because I will be giving an overview of really the why of why uh, we, we built WASM, starting from the very beginning, from the evolution, from the past to the present, and a little bit on the future. And that started for me back in 2012. This is the year that I graduated from college. Uh, and it started with a technology called Asm.js. I had this problem where I had just given a demo and it was terrible. I rendered an application with basically 15 frames per second and that was because I was trying to come up with a portable way to run code in the web. Um, but what I had created was a heavy server connected over a web socket and then like a light client that was, that was rendering. Uh, but then I discovered this blog post by Alon Zakai and he talked about Asm.js as this super efficient subset of JavaScript that when targeted from C++ and, and compiled to it, you would be able to run basically C++ code in the browser and I thought, okay, well that's crazy. Um, I gotta try it out, so I read a bunch about it, um, but really what convinced me is this demo here and I have to switch to Firefox just because that's the true experience. Uh, let me see, here we go. Hit high resolution. And so this demo here is called Banana Bread. Um, it's, it's an arena shooter and what will happen in a second uh, is basically what happened to me the first time uh, that I played this, which is a bot spawns and it takes me out. Um, but I pulled up this, this game and basically blew my mind. I jumped up from my desk and I immediately walked uh, down to, okay, we'll stop it now. Um, I immediately walked down to the corner office and in that corner office was my director who I had just given this terrible demo to you. Uh, but also in there was the VP, uh, my VP, the head of engineering. Um, this is a kind of a mid to large size company. I was working at SAS and these were suit people. This is my first year out of school. I just gave these guys a really terrible demo. So normally what I would do in that situation is immediately turn on my heel and run away. Uh, but I was so excited that I just kind of went right on in. Um, I showed them that exact same demo that I just showed you. Uh, and I logged on their desktop and we started playing it and uh, it really just caught fire because if I can do that in a browser, I can render some graphs, which is really what I was trying to do. So we had about ugh, a million lines of C++ code. And really similar to what Kelsey was talking about before, this code actually was ported from C to Java, later to Flash, and now we're trying to come up with an answer for Flash now that it's basically deprecated in browsers. And what we also were doing around this time in 2012 was trying to support mobile app development. And so what you ended up having is a software stack that looks a little bit like this, where you've got a um, C++ code, you compile it to a bunch of different targets, um, you add a ton of different host glue, um, but also part of that host glue is necessary for rendering the view. Um, so, naturally, uh, I added mscripten, which is the tool chain created by Alone, uh, to let me basically build C++ code and target as in JS. And so, this was just really incredible. I wrote a lot of JavaScript code glue to actually make this work well as an application, but it really did just work. Uh, so that kind of blew my mind because I was basically taking what I would consider the greatest hack of all time, taking a high level language and finding ways to make it optimized so that it can be a low level compilation target. Something else I want to call out around this time is in 2014, I went to a uh, talk at CppCon and the uh, Dropbox team was talking about uh, a language IDL because they were doing exactly the same thing we were doing, which is taking portable C++ code and finding a way to share that code and run it across a lot of different platforms. And so they had a, a, an IDL that I'm showing here, mainly because I am embarrassed to show you the XML that I wrote for doing basically the same thing, uh, but also it, it's gonna be very familiar once I talk about it later. Now there was another amazing demo that happened in 2013 that really helped Asm.js catch fire. The Mozilla team partnered with the Epic Games team and they ported the Unreal Game Engine in five days. So this type of technical demo really caught a lot of people's attention and it brought people to the table like me, a conventional BI analytics application building with that tech meant that there were really real use cases and crazy enough people to go and try this and ship applications. 
And so what that also meant is that now all the browser vendors got together and said, okay, you know, we could push forward a specification for the greatest hack of all time, and that would benefit a lot of people, but what if we started new? What if we started from scratch, from principles, for designing something that is web native? Uh, what would we build if we did that? Now, essentially what we landed with, we're all here today, so we already know it's pretty awesome, uh, but it's web native in that it is it needs to be fast to download, fast to start, it needs to have a really small memory footprint, it needs to be portable because it's code that I'm gonna be running on a lot of different machines running in different browsers. It also needs to be just as safe and sandboxable as JavaScript. Now, what really made it real for me is this demo, which is, yes, I know, yet another game demo, but this is uh, the Unity game engine. Uh, this was in 2016. This was like one of the first like really cool, like, wow, they built this WebAssembly tech, it actually works, and I've got this really complex rendering that's happening in the browser. Um, now, the reason why I keep showing you game demos uh, is for a few different reasons. Uh, Games are really one of the most complicated software engineering projects that we can work on. It pulls across many different disciplines. Uh, also, the developers are uh, the kind of people that want to use cutting edge technology to get the most out of hardware and software. So uh, as far as tech demos go, they're, they're one of the, the, the most fun and they're the ones that you can put in the hands of other people and say, check this out, this is real. Um, so, by uh, 2017, we basically hit WebAssembly MVP, shipped first in Firefox, uh, but then you know, immediately after in Chrome. Around 2017 was when uh, I also shipped my app to production with WebAssembly, um, and I remember in 2018 how the performance just got vastly faster and, and, and improved. Uh, now, the biggest deal here is in 2019, that's when WebAssembly officially became the fourth language of the web. Up to this point, we only had HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. To make a, an official language of the web, it means that we got a lot of things out of it. Um, but we also had to come up with a lot of ways to reach MVP and issued a lot of different features, uh, including things like garbage collection and tail calls. Uh, but those are later added. Um, and so what we got was something that was uh, sandboxable um, and is really, in a lot of ways, pretty simple. It's just a compilation target that many different languages can support. Um, and I, I usually call it uh, a bunch of numbers in a trench coat because at the end of the day, it, the WebAssembly module itself can't do anything unless it's handed a function call from the host. And so a lot of times you'll hear people say deny by default, but can you really deny something when it's not even able to make that call to break out of the sandbox at all? Uh, so with something that is as simple as this type of thing, we were able to get a lot of adoption really fast. Uh, I wasn't the only person uh, building applications. In 2019, I started seeing implementations really across the web. Uh, a lot of cool tech demos that happened around that time include stuff from Adobe and, um, well, just it seemed like everybody was at the table. I believe Shopify showed up around then. Um, so. Uh, 2019 was a huge year for WebAssembly, including the introduction of the WebAssembly systems interface. Um, now, over time, over the past several years, it's really evolved from just being a systems interface. When it was first introduced in 2019, we were really thinking of it as some approximation to running on POSIX to make it really easy for you to take uh, a WASM module and embed it in a non-web use case. I do want to call out from the very beginning, even in 2015, the original use case and goals documents in the WebAssembly design repo was included both web and non-web embedding. So from the very beginning, we knew this was one of those cases that we wanted to solve. Now, WASI itself is, is really that arrow that I have here. It's that function call that I was talking about that gives the WebAssembly module the ability to do a lot of different things like file I.O. and networking that it itself isn't capable of doing. Um, but even more importantly, it allows for granular imports of those functions. And so I can specify just for one WASM module because it needs it, it says it needs access to the system clock. Well, now my WebAssembly host is in charge of sandboxing that capability and how that implementation works. So I can add something like fuzzing of the time so that you can't get an exact system time for security reasons. 
Another amazing thing that happened in 2019 is the Bike Code Alliance was found, formed. So uh, we knew, uh, and, and I really wasn't part of this, I was more like somebody sitting on the sideline being like, yeah, keep going, guys. Um, but the, the Bike Code Alliance was formed because they knew that uh, this is something that is cross-industry-wide. It's not something that we can go alone. Um, and it included a number of major companies like Microsoft, Fastly, Mozilla, and Red Hat as, as the original founding members. Now we're like somewhere around 30 or more. Um, and the goal of the Byte Code Alliance is to build a software foundation that uh, allows it for the WebAssembly ecosystem that has all the same properties that we wanted out of WebAssembly, portability, but also safety and security. Now, from 2020 to 2022, uh, you know, I feel obligated to include these, these years together because I don't know about you all, but the, they sort of blur together for me uh, because um, there's a lot of work that happened around this time, but uh, there was also a global pandemic. Um, but in a lot of ways, this really helped WebAssembly evolve even more and show up in more use cases. Consider, for example, Google Meet and Zoom, they both use WebAssembly and SIMD to be able to blur your background so folks don't have to see your roommate or uh, whatever mess you made for whatever your COVID project that you're working on. Uh, so around this time, um, it wasn't just Google Meet and, and Zoom, but you, uh, web applications. We also saw folks taking advantage of WebAssembly to make it easy to distribute applications because it's portable because it's, it's very efficient to download and start, we're starting to see a lot of folks use it, for example, in Prime Video, where if you have a tiny wrapper around your, your application that's running, say, in a TV, which is kind of a weird environment to target, uh, if you put a lot of your business logic within a WebAssembly module, that piece is the thing that you can now distribute all around the web and makes it really easy to update. Um, and so, of course, most of the streaming applications today also use WebAssembly. Other awesome things that were landing around this time frame was many different proposals that weren't included in that initial WebAssembly spec. Um, so uh, a lot of it was around performance. A lot more was added for basically being able to add more languages that can target WebAssembly, including uh, for tail calls and then now garbage collection, which is getting a lot of excitement and action right now. And we're seeing many more languages now be able to adopt WebAssembly. But there were also a lot of pieces here that laid the groundwork for what you've heard a little bit before talking about the component model. And that includes reference types and multi-value. So once those proposals landed, we were able to build the next new thing, uh, which uh, Kelsey started talking about as the universal computer. So in the present, everybody here is using WebAssembly every day. It's in many different applications. It's in your cloud native stack. It is uh, honestly the best and probably last plugin model you'll ever need. If you want to extend your Envoy application, and there's a talk later talking about how to extend Open Policy Agent, uh, you can use a WebAssembly plugin, uh, which is really just a WebAssembly module to extend it. Now, another example of what I consider the plugin model uh, for WebAssembly is yet another game example, so you shouldn't be surprised. Um, you can tell that I am a gamer, um, and, and I do love these examples. This is the Microsoft Flight Simulator, and this is a new thing that was added this year. Uh, they made it so that you can now run WebAssembly on your Xbox, and the reason to do that is that it makes it so that instead of having to download like a DLL that lets people just run random code from other people on the internet to modify your game, you can now put that in a WebAssembly sandbox environment and run that to you know, create new different ways that controls work in, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now this is actually a really cool story, so I recommend checking that out. Now, let's get to the future. This is the cool part. Um, Kelsey talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to go too deep, but most of us have this problem. Remember the original graph that I showed that where the, we were building C++ and targeting all these different environments? Well, the reality is uh, they're still doing it exactly that way, um, and, and many other people are, um, because we haven't quite made this the reality, uh, but there are places where it can be. So I work at Cosmonic. We build a PaaS for Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud itself uh, is um, a distributed application platform for Wasm. And so Cosmonic being built on Wasm Cloud to host Wasm Cloud and, uh, modules really means it's WebAssembly modules, turtles all the way down. And it's actually a really wonderful way to develop. So this 
uh, I put it in the future category because today most people aren't going to say, I'm going to write a new CLI, I'm going to compile it to WASM, and then it'll just show up and work for everybody, right? Because we're not quite at the point where um, there's just a default, this is how I run WebAssembly desktop applications today. But I think it's totally in the future, probably within a year or two. Um, but we keep talking a lot about the component model. Uh, and I, too, just like Till, believe that this is the future. This is, uh, has the potential to be a universal computer that everybody is able to build on and build on top of the shoulders. Now, there are a lot of different features here of the component model. And I am going to focus more on the why it's important because uh, as engineers, we often focus more and wrap ourselves around the what and the how of things. And there's going to be a lot more talks talking about in great detail how these different tools work and to get started. Um, but the why is often just as important as the what and the how. So with WIT, uh, this is our now our language neutral IDL that uh, many different languages can support and it basically lets us make it really easy so that we can interact with high level interfaces um, for, for what we build in a component. Uh, and so say you have a WIT file, an IDL definition of your API, then you can target WASI Preview 2 use a tool like WIT Bindgen to generate your language bindings. So remember when I was talking a, a little bit earlier about, hey, this, this IDL thing is kind of a cool idea. <laughs> we were talking about it even back in 2012 and 2014. Um, well, you know, this, this, this idea is really a combination of many different other projects that have come before. And so by being able to take an IDL definition that lets you talk in high level languages, we can have many other languages be supported. So what comes out once you run this build process is a WASM component. This is a new ABI. Those first eight bytes is different between a module and a component. Uh, but what comes out is pretty great. Uh, remember when I said that a WebAssembly module is really a bunch of numbers in a trench coat? Well, uh, a WebAssembly component is really a bunch of WebAssembly modules that are in a trench coat um, that also know how to talk to each other. And so by linking them together, uh, I'm able to take languages that are, are usually <laughs> never before have I been able to write a single application that can go from Rust to Go to JavaScript. But I can build a portable component, and it's portable because, again, it's really built on top of the core WebAssembly specification, which itself is portable. So once I take a WebAssembly module, um, or really a WebAssembly component, that has those high level interfaces, I can link them together and use other WebAssembly components as libraries. And now this is uh, what we're talking about when we're saying we can now build a universal computer. In a lot of ways, this is what we think that universal computer looks like. So you might be asking, okay, why now? Um, well, I believe that a lot of the reasons why WebAssembly itself was successful is a lot of the reasons why the WebAssembly component model will also be successful. Uh, it's an open standard. You can join a foundation that's building a lot of the SDK and tooling around that open standard through the Bytecode Alliance. Um, and yes, many of these different approaches have been applied before. You, you know, might throw out Java, write once, run anywhere. Um, but what's different now is a combination of a lot of these different ideas that people have come up with to be able to do something that's unique. Um, and so I'm incredibly excited about it because it also solves real problems that I've seen, including, say, today, when we have a vulnerability like log4j, we have uh, basically the entire world has to go and update their application. They have to go update their dependency, recompile their entire app, redeploy, well, and also retest. Uh, and then we do this everywhere. Um, so what if we had a common dependency like a logging component that a lot of folks pulled in and then all they had to do was relink. They did not have to recompile their module. The energy savings alone is massive. The cost is massive. Cost on, on people time and work uh, is massive. So um, there's so many different things. This is just like one use case that I could pull out that a lot of people have probably felt this pain before. Um, but Components let us do a lot of other things, like being able to use the right tool for the job. So as Kelsey even talked about earlier, uh, we've 
every era of computing, we felt like we had to go and rewrite the entire world in our, in our language. So as a Go developer, I don't want to enable CGO. So I'm probably not even going to share code with another backend engineer that uh, is writing in Rust, for example, um, even though we're both backend folks, we're both kind of working in the same space. Uh, same thing can be said for making it easy for JavaScript developers to be able to pull in code from backend engineers. So that's a type of silo that we've built up across the, the software industry, really a, um, a, a way of fragmenting our ecosystem. How many times has a regular expression library been ported from language to language to language when we got it right the first time with the Perl expression syntax? Now, we can also run our, our components anywhere. So at the time in 2012, it really felt like the browser and the web was the final frontier. And now what we're starting to hear is that uh, it's really the edge. It, you want to get our code running as close to our users as possible. And so the edge can be your phone or your smartwatch or your car. Uh, there are so many different environments that we want to target. And also in 2012, at the time, I was trying to figure out how to take basically x86 compilation and run that everywhere. Now, if you look at anybody's build matrix, you're looking at all kinds of different ARM and CPU architectures. And for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about, it's really important to find ways to make sure our software is secure and sandboxed. So with the component model, we can now build applications in a new way that makes it so that they're easily sandboxed. So um, between that and this concept of being able to share nothing between our components. Components have uh, linear memory, just like in a WebAssembly module, but they also don't share memory between each other. So before I showed how we can have fine-grained capabilities for each component that we pass through, uh, and that uh, one way of doing that is with WASI, uh, but we also make it so that we know at a very granular level exactly what capabilities any individual component in a composed application is using. And we know so that, let me step, step it back. If I pass my keys to the kingdom to an application today, and that includes like a bunch of environment variables, including my AWS keys, uh, then what I get uh, is perhaps a supply chain security attack, where somebody just has access to getting environment variables. And they go and they know the, the typical environment variable for my AWS key. Uh, by making it so that I don't even share memory between the components that are linked together in that application, I have a new type of application model that uh, defends against this type of attack. And so this is really a new model for the current day of software engineering. So I encourage you to get involved. Uh, the standardization work is within the W3C. Uh, all, a lot of the tooling and a lot of the language binding and that work happens within the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, there are also several WebAssembly runtimes that are hosted within the Bytecode Alliance, including WASM time and the WebAssembly micro runtime. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's lots of WebAssembly runtimes out external to the Bytecode Alliance. Um, and I also encourage you to jump on the Bytecode Alliance chat. If, if you're getting started and you're trying to build things, um, starting with Bytecode Alliance tooling is probably where I recommend because I, I'm also on the seat on the technical steering committee. And why now? Uh, because it's open and it feels like 2012 again for me, uh, being able to work with Asm.js for the first time. So thank you. What's up? Thank you so much, Bailey. I always love seeing you speak, and I really love your doodle, uh, a bunch of numbers in trench coats. That one always just makes me uh, lull. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Bailey? Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, Bailey. I'm Sven. Thanks for the amazing talk. Um, I know the uh, component model is coming, so I'm uh, very excited, but it will take time uh, until all the runtimes uh, support the component model. Do you think there will be shims or polyfills in the meantime? Yeah, that's a great question. OK. So um, the component model is coming, right? That was in the future section. Uh, I actually expect uh, people to be able to build in, on top of the component model and basically the t fall time frame. That's when we're targeting 
WASI Preview 2 to release. WASI Preview 2 is going to give you those WIT interfaces and a lot of different uh, APIs that make it really easy to run outside of the browser. There's a talk that's coming up soon that will dive deeper into WASI, so I didn't go too deep there. Um, and so because the component model isn't quite yet available, are there ways to basically polyfill to go from um, where we are today to the component model? And that is absolutely true. So um, I got, I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to demo with Dan Chiarloni, and we showed uh, basically targeting a WASI preview one module, so something that a lot of languages support today. We compiled a WASI preview one. We adapted that to WASI preview two, which adapted it to a component. And then once I had it as a component, I still had to work within existing language ecosystems and runtimes. And so I used a technique that my team coined as a WASI fill, because what I did is I looked at the APIs that my component uses, and I adapted them to work within my host environment. And that is an incredibly powerful way of building things. And it's, it's one of those things that, like, once you realize that you have fundamental Lego building blocks of components that you're able to assemble on top of each other, you just keep assembling and uh, adding more WASI fills to work within your environment. And so, yes, you can start fiddling today. I will say <laughs> that um, it wasn't the easiest to get that demo working. Um, you know, the, a lot of stuff is changing, um, and you need to have versions that align with each other because it's a new ABI and each thing needs to support that exact same ABI. But um, it's very much real um, and I think we'll probably see a pretty cool demo later. Actually, I know exactly which demo we're going to see later and it's going to be awesome. Um, uh, and Bailey's talk from Wasmio is online on their channel if you weren't there at the conference. That was a phenomenal question, by the way. The program committee thinks that the theme for 2023 is the component model in WASI. So later today, we've really tried to curate a couple of talks. And the talk that Bailey is alluding to is a pre-recorded talk, unfortunately. But it's Guy Bedford and um, Peter Hewn. And Peter Hewn uh, from Fastly. And I think that is the talk that will blow your minds. If you think that the, this is far in the future, uh, we saw it privately a few months ago in a developer workshop. And uh, we could not wait to get it on stage here today. Uh, any other questions for Bailey? Before we let her go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Bailey. Great talk as always.